I've been having some fun playing around with the 2013 Mac Pro again, and I think I might have found a, a secret superpower. There are some niche use cases where these older computers are still actually viable for modern workflows. But of course there is a caveat to this, I'm not recommending that you go out and buy a Mac Pro as your main computer, you'd likely be much better off with a more modern Apple Silicon machine. And whenever I put up any content about the 2013 Mac Pro there's always someone commenting to that effect. Why wouldn't you just go and buy a used M1 Mac Mini? And that is a valid argument. But sometimes I feel like those comments miss the point because I didn't buy the Mac Pro to use as a main computer. I bought it because I love the design and it's a bit of nostalgia for me and uh, they're great fun to play around with. I'm a bit of a geek and they're so cheap now. It's amazing how cheaply some people are picking these things up for. And these are still very usable computers. So let's just push that caveat to one side and let me tell you about what I discovered. Now I just happened the other day to be doing some benchmarks and I ran the Blackmagic RAW speed test. Now this is a benchmark made by Blackmagic Design and it's designed to simulate how fast your computer can process Blackmagic RAW video. It does this by testing the CPU and the GPU via the Metal framework for various different sizes of Blackmagic RAW. And we're just going to focus in on the scores for Blackmagic RAW with 12 to 1 compression in HD format, so that's 1080p, 4K, 6K and 8K. Now you might be surprised by some of these figures. And what we decided to do was to run some comparisons on an iMac. So I've got an M1 iMac, it's the 8 CPU core, 8 GPU core model with 16 gigs of RAM. And then I thought, why not test it against uh, an M3? So I've got my M3 MacBook Air here. Now again, that's eight CPU cores, but it's 10 GPU cores, and it has 16 gigs of RAM. And uh, just for fun, I've also got my M1 Max MacBook Pro 14 inch. This is the model with 10 CPU cores and 24 GPU cores, and it has 32 gigs of RAM. And then we also used our other editing machine, which is a MacBook Pro 16 inch with an M2 Max, and that's the full fat version with 12 CPU cores and 38 GPU cores. And again, it has 32 gigs of RAM. So first of all, let's just pop the Mac Pro on our chart. So this is the metal framework that we're testing, the graphics cards. So we've got HD, 4K, 6K and 8K. And here's the Mac Pro's scores. So 2,382 for HD, 595 frames per second at 4K, 232 at 6K, and 148 at 8K. So unbelievably, the Mac Pro has actually got enough performance there to play back multiple streams of 8K Blackmagic RAW. I think that's incredible in itself. But let's get the other machines on the chart. Starting with the iMac M1, just put the numbers up on there. You can see it's not matching up to the Mac Pro. In fact, on average, the Mac Pro is 3.7 times faster than the iMac. What about the MacBook Air with the M3 chip in? Here are the numbers, and again, you can see that it is slower than the Mac Pro. And on average, the Mac Pro is 2.2 times faster than this M3 MacBook Air. So we need to also compare with some heavier weight computers. Let's put on my MacBook Pro 14 inch, and you can see now, we're just starting to beat out the Mac Pro because this M1 Max is about 17% faster across the board. And just for fun, let's stick on the 16 inch M2 Max MacBook Pro. And as you can see, it's got the Mac Pro comfortably beaten. It's about 55% faster. So the graphics cards on these Max chips are very powerful and they are comfortably able to outperform the Mac Pro when it comes to decoding B-RAW footage. But if you take the standard M chips, the M1 and the M3, the Mac Pro with the D700 graphics cards has them comfortably beaten. So let's check out the CPU benchmark. Now typically you're never going to use your CPU to decode B-RAW content. If you load it up into DaVinci Resolve, it's going to use the Metal Framework. If you're using a PC, then it will use the graphics card on the PC over the CPU every time. So this is just a synthetic benchmark, if you like. But here are the Mac Pro's numbers. And bear in mind, we've got the 8-core E5-2667 version 2 CPU in this machine, uh, 64 gigs of RAM. So for HD, we're looking at 411 frames per second, 102 at 4K, 40 at 6K, and 25 at 8K. So I think it's safe to say that above 1080p, you wouldn't be using the CPU in your Mac Pro ever to decode Blackmagic RAW. How does that compare then to the M1 iMac? Well, let's put the numbers in, and you can see that actually the Mac Pro outperforms it. 
and uh, it's about 35% faster. Let's put in the M3 MacBook Air. Now the balance has swung in the M3's favour. The M3 is 26% more performant than the 8-core CPU in the Mac Pro. Let's put the M1 Max on. And you'll notice this is quite interesting because it's almost identical in scores to the M3 chip in the MacBook Air. And that does lead us to a question. Does that mean that you're just as well off with an M3 MacBook Air as you would be with an older M1 Max MacBook Pro? We're going to answer that question with the next set of tests that we do. And it's a pretty resounding answer. So stay tuned for that. Let's put the uh, M2 Max in with that powerful 12 core CPU. And as you can see, it's comfortably beating out the Mac Pro. It's about 71% faster across the board. Now, of course, this is using the multi-threaded capabilities of the CPU. If we were doing a single core test, then all of the Apple Silicon chips would annihilate this old Xeon chip in the Mac Pro. We need to take this a step further and actually do some testing in DaVinci Resolve. So we loaded up one of our recent projects. This is our review for the NeoBuds Pro 2. And this timeline features various different video formats. The main studio shot is at 6K and it's in Blackmagic RAW format. And we're using the Constant Quality 5 codec for this. But we've also got B-roll that was shot on iPhone and some of it shot on DJI Osmo. Those B-roll clips are at 4K, 50 frames per second, and they're in H.265 format. And H.265 is a codec that usually brings older CPUs and older computers to their knees. But as we scrub through the timeline here on the Mac Pro, what you'll notice is the Blackmagic RAW plays back seamlessly. There's a slight delay when you load up anything that's H.265, but it is capable of playing it, which actually surprised me a little bit. So the benchmark that we've just been looking at very much applies to the timeline performance and the experience that you'll get whilst you're editing this footage. But what happens when we come to rendering? Because typically you don't render out into Blackmagic RAW, you're going to convert into something like H.264 for YouTube. Or you might want to create a ProRes master that you can use further down the line. So we've done three different rendering tests and we've timed it on all of these machines. So uh, let me just get the right page up on my spreadsheet. And again, we're going to have charts up for you to have a look at. So we're going to start with the full project timeline. And what we're going to do is export this as a ProRes 422HQ master file in 4K resolution. So we set it going on the Mac Pro. Now this timeline is 856 seconds long and the Mac Pro rendered it in 668 seconds. And that means that it's averaging just over 32 frames per second. Bearing in mind that we're outputting a 25 frame per second video, then this is rendering at just faster than real time speed. But let's see if we can make it a bit easier now. We're gonna create a copy of the timeline and just take out anything that's not Blackmagic RAW. So we'll remove all of the B-roll and we'll just render out the Blackmagic RAW of the main studio shot. And again, we're going to ProRes 422HQ at 4K, and this time it takes 646 seconds to render. Obviously the timeline is now a bit shorter at 832 seconds. And that gives us a very similar result, an average frames per second of rendering of 32.2. And finally, we just want to simulate taking a timeline and rendering it for YouTube in 1080p format in H.264 codec. This rendered in 627 seconds. And that means an average frame rate of just over 33 frames per second. So what we're going to do now is see how this compares to the M1 iMac. Now remember the M1 chip has a dedicated encoder for H.264. So on that third test, it should have an advantage. So for that first timeline, we're outputting ProRes 422HQ at 4K using all of the footage. And the iMac finished in 872 seconds, which is 24.5 frames per second on average. And that means the Mac Pro is faster by about 31%. That's quite a remarkable result. The second timeline, remember we took out all of the B-roll that was in different formats. So this is just Blackmagic RAW. We're outputting again to ProRes at 4K and the iMac did it in 924 seconds, which is 22.5 frames per second on average. So again, the Mac Pro has won and it's actually about 43% faster for this particular timeline. So let's go to the final timeline where the iMac should have a bit of an advantage with its H.264 encoder. This time we're taking that B-Raw footage and we're going to a YouTube video at 1080p in H.264. It takes the iMac 
821 seconds. So that's uh, 25 frames per second on average. So the Mac Pro has won again, and it's about 31% faster. Did you expect that? So this is an M1 chip in an iMac which has active cooling, so you've got a fan which was definitely coming on during the render test, and it cannot beat the Mac Pro for these specific video timelines. And I was particularly surprised by this one. I did think the iMac would uh, have it beaten on the H.264 export. So what about the M3? Surely that's got the Mac Pro beaten. Well, let's add the results on, starting with that first timeline, and it took 1,141 seconds, which is uh, just shy of 19 frames per second on average. That's quite low. Let me just fill in the other figures for the other timelines. The B-RAW only export to ProRes was 1,175 seconds, so that's just under 18 frames per second on average. And that last one, the export to YouTube, well, that was 1,098 seconds. So uh, again, just under 19 frames per second on average. So not only has the M3 been beaten by the Mac Pro, it's also been beaten by the M1. That doesn't make any sense, particularly when you consider that the M3 has another advantage in that it has a ProRes encoder. The problem here is that we're using a MacBook Air and there is no active cooling in the MacBook Air. So this computer is just not able to maximize the performance of the M3 chip that's inside it. And I guess that is perhaps a lesson for us. As we said earlier, the M3 CPU scores look very similar to the M1 Max, but of course, the M1 Max only comes in a MacBook Pro and it has active cooling, so it doesn't suffer from these same thermal throttling issues. Now, I don't have an M2 Mac Mini or an M3 iMac to test against this machine. My expectation is that an M3 with active cooling would be ahead of the Mac Pro, and the M2 would probably be mostly on par with it. But that's just my best guess. I, I haven't tested those to be sure. So how does the Mac Pro compare then to, say, the M1 Max chip? Let's just throw up the results for that. And on the first timeline, we're at uh, 75 frames per second. The second timeline is 67 and a half. And then the third timeline, 76 and a half frames per second. So the M1 Max comfortably outperforms the Mac Pro. I don't think there's gonna be many people who are in the market for a Max chip who might also be considering this old Mac Pro. I mean, that's just not gonna happen. And I have to come back to the caveat that I mentioned at the outset. I am not by any means suggesting that the Mac Pro always outperforms M1 or M3 MacBook Airs. It doesn't. But there are niche areas where these older computers still have more performance than you might expect. And true, it will eventually become impossible to get the latest Mac OS version to run on these machines, but then the world of Linux opens up and lots of people are already using their Mac Pros with Linux on them to do all sorts of things. And it's also important to say that what we've showed you today is not the only niche scenario where one of these older machines will actually outperform Apple Silicon. And if you know of any of these specific scenarios, please let us know in the comments section. If there's any more that I can test and make videos on, then I, I will try and do that. I'm really interested to read your comments on this one, folks. Thanks as always for supporting the channel. I'll see you again soon for some more geekery.